This is Gregor Hackmark. He's going to talk about the transparency law in Hamburg. Um, please welcome him with a huge round of warm applause and the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. When we started this, this whole initiative, the coalition to introduce a new transparency law here in Hamburg, we were only like five people maybe. So this is quite a big audience for us. And uh, among the five people in June last year, 2011, there were um, members from the Chaos Computer Club, there was Transparency International, and there was More Democracy. And I'm on the steering board of More Democracy, which is an initiative that's, co that's campaigning for the introduction of national referendums in Germany. But we also try to improve um, um, state democracy and state referendums um, in all 16 states of Germany. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the political structure in Germany, we have a federal state and we have 16 um, state, uh, well, we have a federal uh, republic and we have 16 states in Germany and one of those states is the free city of Hamburg where you are right now. And um, in the free city of Hamburg, it is possible to put on citizens' legislation. Just like in California, you start and draft your legislation, you collect signatures, and then you get it passed or you don't get it passed. So when, uh, when we got together last year in June 2011, we were thinking that we want to improve people's access to information because um, from our point of view, of course, it's really important to have access to information. And most of you will be familiar with the freedom of information laws, which, uh, for instance, in Sweden, has been on for 200 years already and guarantees people's or citizens' access to information. And also in, in Hamburg, we had a freedom of information law, which was introduced only in 2006. And actually, we are, um, there are still five states in Germany where there's no freedom of information law whatsoever. You won't be surprised. Among them is Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg or um, Hessen. And, uh, but in, in Hamburg, actually, we had a freedom of information law. But um, the previous freedom of information law, you only can get information upon request. And that's in most countries the case. So if you want to, if you're a journalist, if you're a citizen, if you're an interested um, citizen who wants information, what you have to do is like you have to file an application to the administration. And then you have to wait. And sometimes you also have to pay fees. And it's very time consuming. And also very bureaucratic. And guess what? Most administrators or public, um, public servants, they will come up with whatever explanation and whatever idea to prevent you from getting this information. And sometimes you even have to sue the city to get that information. Even our lawyer, uh, well, our, 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 our mayor here in Hamburg, he had a uh, freedom of information request going when he wasn't the mayor. And he had to, um, I think he, he sued his own government for like two years. And he was still not successful until he became the mayor and then he had access to that information. But the, the lawsuits are still pending. So it's always the same. You try to get information. We think it's your lawful right to get that information as the citizens. But it's very, in fact, it's very, very hard to get. So we thought, um, well, this shouldn't be the case anymore. And um, we wanted to turn this passive information law where you can only get um, information upon request into an active information law. We thought, why should citizen ask the city for information? We think the city or the state should provide the information by law. So what do we mean? Basically, we um, thought it would be great if the city is publishing all relevant, all, impo all important information on the internet in an open data format by law, without any request, without any fees, Without, uh, without any suits that we have to file, but actually just as a matter of course um, of, the, um, of the city of Hamburg to publish all that information. So um, we got together uh, June 2011, just a very small group of people, and we thought like, okay, well, this is what we want, but how do we actually, how do we actually draft this law? So we thought like, leave the lawyers away because you know, like they will always tell you what you can't do. But we actually wanted to know, you know, we actually wanted to put down what we want. 
So what we did is that we thought like, okay, what type of information is really important that um, the city should publish by law? And we thought like all government decisions, all contracts, most important ones, the contracts the city is signing with, um, for instance, letting you this Congress Center here. Um, expert advices, you know, like never believe a study that you haven't faked yourself. And um, there's a lot of in, there's a lot of tax money invested in some sorts of studies, and you never get access to these studies. Sometimes they are actually put in the drawer before, and they're not published at all because they're not in the interest of the government officials. So that's why we thought, like, okay, every expert advice, all the studies, all official int introductions, all grant decisions. So if the city is giving it, uh, giving away money and is subsidizing something, then they should also publish this by law. Um, all statistics. Geodata, which we thought was very important because the city owns, you know, like, of course, all geodata um, of all streets, um, of all public buildings. And um, we thought this would be really important to publish. So what we did is first we thought, like, well, the city should publish everything. Well, then we thought, like, then, then we said, well, there, there could be some things that are um, but difficult to publish or that they're really of no interest or very bureaucratic. So we came up with a whitelist and the whitelist actually tells the city what they have to publish. Um, and we, uh, we, uh, we actually introduced an opening clause because we thought like, well, there's 15 types of information the city has to publish by law, but there could be more types of information that could be even more relevant to people in the future that we cannot think of. So we said like, in addition to this, to this information, all other relevant information, all information of public interest. And how do you prove public interest? Well, you can, you can collect signatures, um, or you can prove it by um, requesting a certain type of information over and over again. So at some point, it just makes sense for the city to publish that information. Um, and of course, beyond that, anything that we forget, and it's not included in this white list, you can still get up on request. So anything that you will, you will not find on the information register um, that the city is publishing by law, you can still file your request just in old-fashioned times. So we didn't want to prevent or restrict any access to information, but we actually want to enlarge this. So the new thing of this law, the transparency law here in Hamburg, is that not only can you request information, but the city is actually obliged to publish information on a centrally uh, located information register, which is anonymously accessible uh, by open data standards. So that was really important, of course, for the KS Computer Club, and they drafted that paragraph. Um, who's actually obliged to um, publish that information? First of all, of course, the administration. So any public um, officials or any public administration, um, ha they have to publish that information. But um, re remember that more and more um, public services are privatized. So a lot of um, public services that you think that were public, like let's say um, waste disposal or the water or electricity, etc., they they got privatized in the past, but they are still very important for the city uh, for for the for the citizens to actually learn about and get information upon, and so that's why we th w that that's why we extended the definition of authority beyond just the administration. But we said like basically, authorities are all natural or legal private bodies if they deliver public services. Clear. Um, and if the majority is controlled by the city of Hamburg or one of its authorities, which in most cases is still the case also with um, um, public services. But of course, um, this control can also be defined by if you are obliged to take the service. So if you, if, if for instance, if you don't have the choice of the electricity grid you want to be part of, or a phone line or whatever, um, then this would also be a public authority. So if you don't have the choice to, to get a certain service from, and it's a natural monopoly, then um, you're also obliged to publish that information. 
Are there exceptions? Yes, there are exceptions, but actually only two major exceptions. Just like the case Computer Club always wanted to have private data private and public data public, uh, we exempted personal data, which I think is a, is a matter of course. And uh, we, that was actually a big, that was actually a big controversy of the law because the people say, well, transparency, you know, like they want to get all the personal and secrets and that's dangerous, etc. And we said, well, it's not dangerous. Um, for us, the freedom of information or the transparency law is the same as protecting public uh, or private data. So it's not, it's, it's basically not contradictory to each other, but it's, you know, part of the same coin. And we let the Freedom of Information Officer, which is also the Data Protection Officer, which is one of the strictest in, in Germany. He's based in Hamburg at the moment. He's, I think, fighting another battle with Facebook and Google. Um, we said, like, okay, well, we don't intend to publish personal data, so why don't you draft this paragraph on protecting personal data? So that, that was the end of the discussion. Um, business secrets. Um, business secrets, I mean, they are protected by the Constitution in Germany, so we had, to, you know, we had to give them some protection, but we very closely defined it. And always when there's, like, when there's a high public interest, then business secret, secrets have to step back. Um, I'll give you some cases in a, in a second. The second thing that was really important is, like, how is that information to be published? Well, you know, like you can publish information one or the other way. You can, you know, like put everything in a folder and give it to people, or you can publish it in an open data format on the internet, so you can actually have it machine readable, and it has to be um, it, it has to be free of charge, of course, anonymously accessible, um, and the, in in the open data format. So basically, we already wrote into that, that legislation in what way the information has to be published in Hamburg. Um, and this, we gave the city two years to actually come up with the information register. So um, how is the, well, there, there are international examples for information registers. For instance, there's one in Slovakia. In Slovakia, for instance, all treaties, all contracts that are signed by the government have to be published in the information register, starting at um, zero euros. The problem in, in Slovakia is it's not open data. So they scan in documents, and um, there's not much use you can make of that information unless you really specifically know what you're looking for. Um, there's an open data portal in Berlin. So this is, for instance, um, about, the new, about the airport and the new airport that is being built in Berlin. And um, it's noise emissions. And this is, uh, the, these are measures and statistics by the city of Berlin. So you can look up that open data and see whether in your own neighborhood you will be affected by the new airport, and if so, to what extent. So that's, um, for us, that was really, that was really an important uh, point to um, to, uh, to introduce that in information register. So not only that we want to define what information has to be published, but also in what way it has to be published. So um, how did we get this passed? I mean, of course, as you can imagine, when we came up in, in June 2011 with the ideas, and basically we had three months, we, we gave ourselves uh, three months, we opened a wiki. If you Google uh, uh, Wiki Transparenzgesetz, then you, then you get to our wiki and you can see all our public minutes. You can see like all our discussions. Um, it actually, you know, like the group grew. You know, it started with five, but it ended up with um, maybe hundreds. And um, we tried to convince the, the politicians here in the city of Hamburg. And uh, guess what? They weren't very amused, and they were not really open. Um, about this law, of course, everyone's for transparency, of course. Um, but you know, like if you then ask them to pass your law, you know, they go like, "Well, you know, that's actually not our, it's not our sphere, really." So um, that's why we resorted to citizens' lawmaking. Um, and in Hamburg, there are three steps you have to take. First, you have to take an initiative. So first of all, you need a draft, and uh, so you have to write your own law. So when we came up with the ideas, it was actually an idea, well, it was a collection of different ideas, but it wasn't really a law, you know, like it wasn't really a proper 
piece of legislation. So what we did is that because we were in such a hurry, we want, because we wanted to hit the next federal election uh, with our referendum, um, we basically got some expert advice and we recruited a former Supreme Court judge, which uh, we've been working with before and he was volunteering to do this and he came to our session and uh, I think it was September 2011, we had a session with like 20, 30 people and we walked through every paragraph that we thought would be, you know, like what we want in this law. And the, the judge was sitting there and he was listening and was taking notes, it was four hours, very disciplined. And he goes like, okay, I, yeah, I, I can see what you want, okay. Well, and he, he noted down uh, everything that he thought was important. And so we walked through this paragraph by paragraph, step by step. And then we said, like, and he, then he said, so, so what do you need? And we said, well, we need a piece of legislation uh, by next Wednesday. And it was, <laughs> it was Wednesday. So we gave him one week. And uh, he goes like, whoa, OK. But um, he did it. So he came up, and we, I think we had like 25 paragraphs. We wanted to, we had some penalties for public servants, you know, like by prison, if you don't publish information. He goes like, well, you know, this is the criminal code. You know, we can't put this in your state law, but <laughs> um, good call. And, and basically, um, so we, we, we got this, we got this uh, piece of legislation ready within one week. And um, then, and we were very happy, and we submitted it to the city hall. And, uh, and you have to basically go and register your citizens' initiative at the city hall, and then you have six months to collect 10,000 signatures. So you have to go around and you have to find fellow citizens in the streets. Actually, I remember a day when we were um, when we actually collected signatures in front of this building. And whenever you know, it was some some sort of congress as well, and um, we we basically asked everyone who was entering the building and got a lot of signatures here as well. Um, so we gave ourselves six six weeks only because we really wanted to hit the schedule. We knew it was politically important to go on the same day with the referendum or to put the referendum on the same day as the next federal parliament will be elected, which will be September next year, so it's September 2013. And um, that's why we really had to hurry up. And within six weeks, we collected more than 15,000 signatures. Um, then the second stage would have been a petition. And the third stage would have been the referendum. And the referendum, as I, as I mentioned, would have been the next elections. So the petition, well, the second stage, the 62,000 signatures, that would have been the hardest stage. 5% of all the electorate of Hamburg to sign and rally behind our law. Um, I'm saying that in the, in, the, in the conditional clause because it didn't happen the second stage because we passed it after the first stage. And um, how we did that is, oh, sorry. Oppala. Oh no, now it got interesting because now it's um, the, the picture is coming up. Hold on. <laughs> oh, I <it> didn't. <laughs> All right. So we just uh, we just wait a bit, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and I try to to hopefully restart the computer in the meantime. Okay. So let's see whether it comes up. So um, basically, you anyways already had the most important information. Um, so all the rest of the presentation would have been, um, oop, would have been basically some pictures of the of the campaign. So when we started the when we started the law in well we basically we submitted the law in September 2011. So on the anti international anti-corruption day on December the 9th 2011. 
um, we submitted that 15,119 signatures. And um, at that stage, the politicians here, the politicians did, did take us serious. Okay, well, I'll just let this without pictures now. <laughs> So at this stage, actually, the, the politicians did take us serious. And um, they were like, well, well, they have a law. They have some ideas. You know, like, it looks pretty good. They had a Supreme Court judge to work it over. So we had a parliamentary hearing. And at this parliamentary hearing, there were about 120 people. We had to go to a hotel um, to fit all the people in there. And there was the, basically, it was be before the Justice Committee of the, of the state parliament. And um, we said, like, look, this might be a bit unfamiliar and this might sound a bit peculiar to you, but we don't expect our piece of legislation to look the same after the hearing than it looks now. Because we expect you to contribute ideas, right? You're the parliament, you're the elected representatives. This is our first proposal here, and we invite you to improve it. So first of all, they were like, you know, like actually they wanted to, you know, they were very conflictual in the beginning. But then, you know, it was really difficult for them to, to work against this. And we said like, and they, they came up with some ideas and they said, well, transparency is great, but you should also publish um, all um, judicial decisions. We said, well, great idea, we'll introduce it. <laughs> um, and they go like, yeah, but the, pro the, the personal data, isn't that dangerous? You want to Oh no, we've got the freedom, you know, we've got the data protection officer here among us. So we'll formally ask you to draft this paragraph for us. And he goes, okay. <laughs> and um, so we basically included all the politicians. And the pub parliamentary hearing actually helped us to make this law into a law that also the parliamentarians to some extent could identify with. Of course, they were not. They didn't dare to say, "Well, get ri get rid of this altogether." And um, after the parliamentary hearing, which was took about seven hours, um, we had like plenty of new ideas. We made plenty of commitments to the politicians, and we redrafted the law because we said, "Well, you know, like this law was drafted within one week. There are there is room for improvement." Um, and so we, we basically took another six weeks. We redrafted the law and submitted it again in a second version, which we actually liked much better than the first one because we also realized that there were some things that we simply forgot about. For instance, um, the ruling party, the Socialist Party here in Hamburg, they wanted us to publish all the salaries of the managing directors of public companies. We said, well, that's a great idea, of course. <laughs> um, but you know, like if we make this concession, you know, like you have to give us something else, something else for this. So, um, so it's like it's like how, how politics work. And and then in May, basically, when we had the new when 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 we had the new proposal for this law, and uh, I mean, like of course, you know, first thing that the the parties did is that we'll take you to the constitutional court, and they will you know like they will kick out your law because it could be against the constitution this and this point. But actually, when we submitted it the second time, they didn't have those concerns anymore. And um, then we said, okay, well. You know, like, why don't you pass it in Parliament? And they go like, hmm. They really didn't want us to have this referendum at the same um, at the same day of the uh, federal elections, because um, there's a new party coming up, or that grew in, in Germany quite heavily over the last years. You probably have all heard about it. It's the Pirate Party, and um, and they were scared. They 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 thought they're going to lose votes at the next federal elections. And I remember the the leader um, of the prior, um, of the Socialist Party, well, the, and the and of the parliamentary and, and the Social Party, and said, "Well, said like Gregor, like the only reason why we might pass your law is not because we like it so much. It's because we don't want the Pirate Party to win more than 10 percent of the votes at the next state elections." <laughs> and I said, "Like, well, I don't care why you why you're going to pass it." as long as you do. And um, so we actually entered negotiations with, um, with um, the, the, the ruling party, the Socialist Party. It was very, um, I mean, it was very um, 
uh, intense, let's say, in the beginning. So we came with, a, you know, like with, with our ideas, with the law to the city hall, and we negotiated, and it, you know, like got really late at night. I think the first round was like five hours, the next was six hours, and we always said, like, you know, like we we don't know whether we're going to get this passed in the coalition. The people are preparing for the second stage. They all organized and mobilized their friends to come to Hamburg. We have tents, you know, like we we already organized the kitchen for the camp um, that we want to have. And actually, everyone's looking forward to this campaign. So, I mean, there's from our point, I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no reason to give up this campaign now. So, if you don't want to pass it, that's fine. We'll just ask the people to pass it. And it's anyways better to 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 get some more confidence and uh, and consciousness in, among the people to help make them learn about this law, and so they can actually use it. And they were like, oh yeah, wait a minute, maybe there's something we can do, and um, and. Uh, and they were trying everything. Like once, you know, sometimes they were trying threats, and they were like, "Oh, you think you can pass this law? And you know what? If you don't concede, you know, if you don't make a concession now, you know, we mobilize the unions, and we mobilize the media, and we mobilize our party, and we crush you at a referendum." And it's like, "Well," we, and we we just said like, "Well, maybe we should open the window, get in some fresh air, and you know, restart negotiations here, um, just to calm you down a bit." <laughs> and it was it was it was hilarious. It was a very a very intense experience, but um, to make long things short, um, we actually got a we we actually got it passed, and it was passed on the 13th of June this year in Parliament. So after we secured basically the majority uh, in Parliament, we also asked, of course, the oppositions to, uh, opposition parties to join. I mean, the Green Party was. Anyways, already joining the coalition before the left party joined the coalition. The, the liberal party was sort of observatory status, but they still joined in. So it was only the conservative party that we had to convince, but we didn't have to convince because we already had a landslide majority in parliament. So at this point, they thought like, well, you know, it's probably harder to be against it than to just pass it. Um, so we don't have to explain so much for the media. So we, two days before we actually passed the law in Parliament, we had a big press conference. And at this press conference, we invited all the party leaders to come and to introduce the law together with us and to tell the media and the public that this law will be passed the day after tomorrow. And, um, and so they did. And uh, you won't believe how many fathers and mothers this law actually suddenly had. Because of course, it was the law of the, all the other parties. And um, and we got it, and we got a unanimous vote um, on the 13th of June 2012 this year. And um, basically, three months later, the law the law entered force. It was the 6th of October this year in Hamburg, and um, we already have like major successes. I mean, like we have a, a concert hall here in Hamburg which was supposed to cost something like uh, 70 million in the beginning, uh, potentially neutral to the taxpayers because there were private condominiums refinancing and, and private contributions to actually pay for this concert hall. Um, but now we are at 525 million so far, and it's still not finished. And um, the contracts, were the problem with this concert hall, but the contract, the contract, the contracts have been published last week. So, due to this law, the uh, the city was obliged to, con to to publish the contracts, and now they are online. They are not open data format. I mean, it's a PDF that you cannot even print, but I mean that's not the biggest problem here. Um, but it's still the first step towards transparency. And um, next, uh, basically in two years' time, so um, October 2014, we will have an information register. And then um, the city has to publish all the information that we basically put down in this law. And um, yeah, great success. I, actually, that's the end of the story. Thank you. So thank you very much, Gregor. Um, we still have plenty of time left. So if you have any questions to Gregor or about the transparency law, please go to one of the four microphones in the hall, and uh, we'll take your question. 
Um, great initiative, Gregor. Thanks for talking about that. Um, appreciation, very good. Uh, could you tell anything about the technical standard of the, the API or, or something uh, you can do with the data, uh, with machines or applications or something? No, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm not the, the tech guy here. Um, but basically, the, the law is very general. I mean, like, in, in the sense that it has to be machine readable, it has to be open data. Um, it cannot be it cannot be dependent on one producer or you know like one certain software company um, and we always offer the city you know like to also make a suggestion like what specific data format they can use but we ask them to basically tell us what they're using right now what kind of inf IT infrastructures and they were unable to do that because they are using so many different systems I think they have 200 IT projects going at the moment uh, they are using different formats, etc. So it's a great opportunity for the city to actually come up with one open data standard and to standardize their own, basically their own data. And the information register, what's very important, uh, what's very interesting about that, will be located and hosted by the national archive, which makes sense because at some point all the public files go into the archive anyways and they invest more in like digital um, archiving of information. And um, so at the moment they are, they are figuring, they are trying to figure out like what sort of formats and files um, they're using. But I don't think that there has been a decision. Um, we formed a council to implement this law and uh, the Case Computer Club is also on the council and um, they will, uh, basically introduce and give ideas and you know like what formats um, can be used so if you want to get involved then please get in touch after and we'll we'll put you in the invitation list and um, maybe can also get you as an expert in there Hi. Um, as a, can you hear me yeah. yes uh, as a Hamburg uh, citizen it is hmm? interim okay Sorry, I'm not used. <laughs> uh, as a Hamburg citizen, I very much appreciate this uh, initiative. But um, I think the next fight we have to do is fighting with the uh, Vogonismus. Is there defined where this information has to be published? So, or can they publish it uh, somewhere? So it is not uh, lookable at the, from mm -hmm. the public. So is there a website saying slash Hamburg slash uh, transparency? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we define that the information has to be published at a central information register, which of course has to be publicly available through, we didn't call it the internet, but publicly available communication networks. Because, you know, like the internet could be called something else in 20 or 50 years. So um, there will be a central repository for all that information, and it will be a full text information register or full data. Um, for instance, in Bremen, um, small state, um, also in northern Germany, they have some sort of registry where they only publish the links to some space on their intranet, which we think is not enough because it's all sorts of different formats, you know, they're still working with uh, doc formats or um, um, Excel sheets, etc. And uh, so that we thought that that wouldn't be enough. Um, we want the information to be centrally um, published in one information register based on open data formats. Okay, yeah, I, th I hear we have a question from the interwebs. Uh, Mole from uh, IRC asks, what would you suggest to other activists in other federal states to achieve uh, similar laws? Well, I would I would just suggest to just do it. I mean, like basically, when we when we got together, you know, like we were not really well. Of course, you know, like we as a small um, nucleus of people, we were really confident, and we thought, like, okay, we're gonna pass this. If we can't pass it by parliament, mm -hmm. then we'll we'll pass it in a referendum. So um, first of all, don't wait for politicians to do your job. Get together, draft legislation and start a referendum campaign. And in most states, actually in all of Germany states, it's possible to start a referendum campaign by actually drafting your legislation and start to collect signatures. So at some point, if, you're, if you look, I mean, like in, in Hamburg, I mean, like we did not expect the parliament or parliament here in Hamburg to pass this law. 
um, we actually did expect the referendum to happen. And we were sure that you know it's going to be hard and they were going to have a big counter campaign and they will scare and fear people, um, but we will still win. But it, um, but I mean, it, it, it just happened that you know, like it was politically opportunistic, from the political points, of parties' points of view, to pass it now, because what political parties count in is basically votes at the next elections. That's their, that's their currency. So, um, my suggestion would be um, to activists um, all over Germany, is have a look at the law, adapt it to your state, and get going. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Um, I have two questions. If you had had to go to the referendum stage, would would the result uh, have been binding to to politicians, and uh, would there have been something like a minimum ballot to reach for you? Yes. Um, basically, we had we had problems with referendums in the state of Hamburg before. The we were the last state that got the possibility for citizens' initiatives and referendums was only introduced in our constitution in 1996. For those from outside Germany, it's like most Western states in Germany, they did not have the possibility to run a national referendum on the state level. It was actually only after reunification that was one of the great contributions that we got out of reunification was more direct elements or more direct democracy in national state constitutions. Unfortunately, we could not introduce it at the time in the national constitution, but in, in all state constitutions it was introduced. So in, in Hamburg, um, we had two cases of national referendums that were overruled by parliament in the past. One was when we, when citizens in Hamburg voted against selling off the, um, the, uh, the state hospitals in 1990, it was in 2004. And another referendum that I was also involved in, I also was partly drafting this, uh, when we introduced new elect a new electoral law. Uh, which got passed in 2004 and was overruled by parliament in 2006. So that's what, what we did is that we changed the constitution in the state of Hamburg in 2008 to make referendums binding and now they cannot be overruled by parliament just like they, they could in the past. What's the minimum requirement? It depends when, if you have a referendum um, at the same day of an election, you need the majority of the votes um, also in relation to those that participated in the elections. Okay, so if, if, if let's say 50% participate in an election, you need at least 25% of the votes in favor of your referendum. So that you have a double majority. You need more vo yes votes than no votes, well that's clear. And you also need a quorum of more than half those people that voted in the parallel election. If you don't have an election going parallel to the referendum, you need to have at least 20% of the electorate supporting your referendum. And in both cases, it would be binding then. Um, do you think that this is uh, too high or, or high enough, 20%? I think it's too high because um, I think um, there should not be any quorum. I think um, if there are more people voting in favor of it than against it, it should pass. That's actually the natural thing in most countries that have uh, direct democracy. For instance, in Switzerland, um, quorums are unheard of. I mean, there you submit your law and whoever wants to participate, participates. And you know, like whoever gets the majority, passes their law. I mean, that's the most natural thing. But here in Germany, you know, like politicians, they always argue like, oh, we can't trust the people. Unless they have to vote for us, of course, then it's totally fine. Um, but if they m make their own laws, that's dangerous. So that's why they wanted to make it as difficult as possible. And so I think there should not be a quorum at all. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, ah. Okay. Uh, when you uh, present your law to uh, the legislature, um, how much of a reaction did you get from them? 
uh, like, you know, oh, hi, here, let, help, let me help you fix this. You know, you're going to need to have this exemption, otherwise it'll never get through. We're going to have to do this, we're going to have to do this. Um, really, I'm trying to help you out here um, versus actual real genuine suggestion that would actually you know, help the law rather than trying to build in exemptions and mm -hmm. you know, trying, to, trying to strip away and chip away at it. I mean, one, one piece of advice and one, one thing that I learned uh, through this process is you never give away the master. The, you know, like your own legislation. So you can collect ideas and proposals, but you have to draft them yourselves. I mean, you can say, well, you know, like you can come up with a certain way or phrase to introduce it, and we'll look over it, and then we'll introduce it. And basically, we had our Supreme Court judge there and said, well, you know, like they suggested this and this phrase. What do you think? Can we introduce it? Should we, et cetera? I mean, politically, we were making the decisions. Um, at some point, you know, like we were sitting around and we're saying, and some people were like, well, you know, can we go so far? Are we allowed to do that? And then our Supreme Court judge said, well, you're the de legislature. You know, like, of course, you can do whatever. You know, you are the lawmakers right now. And, um, but uh, getting back to the hearing, I mean, there were, you know, some politicians that were sort of helpful, especially the opposition, you know, and there were um, politicians that were not very helpful and they did not see this as an expert hearing, but actually as a political hearing. And then there were like a whole bunch of professors, like every party was allowed to, uh, to appoint one professor, like one legal expert. And some of them had some good stuff to say, and we basically took the ideas. There's 72 pages of minutes, okay, which were, by the way, published within one week after the hearing. Thank you again to the administration. It was very helpful. And we worked with those minutes. And then we basically took the best ideas and introduced them. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's actually pretty encouraging. Okay, uh, my name is Michael Enas from NLX Foundation. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was tempted to talk about direct democracy and, and, and how the Swiss got women to vote only in 1976 directly because of this, this, this direct referenda, but I'm not going into that. But my question is, how have you arranged the, the, the legal rights of, of the publication? So it may be in a machine processable format, but, but that doesn't say that people are actually licensed to use it and, and put it into an app where you can walk around the city of Hamburg and show where the money is splashing against the walls or something like that. So are there copyright restrictions still on it? Because that's what I hear from a lot of people that are into open data. The, 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 the actual license of the data matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the license, I mean, that's of course a problem. And so we basically obliged the city to buy the license, um, for instance, for studies, to be published by anyone and can be used by all the data that's published on the information register can be used by anyone for any purpose. So um, that was a big argument in the, you know, like in the negotiations. They were saying like, well, you know, like the geodata, we're making so much money of this and we're going to lose all this money because if people will not buy our data anymore because, you know, we have to give it away for free. And so we we're saying like, so how much money are you actually making? And it was something like, 300,000 or something. Uh, it's like, so how, how much is the, the staff actually costing you that's selling this data? And it turns out, you know, like they, that is actually cheaper to just give it away than to write invoices for it. And, um, and so for us, I mean, like, of course, it was really important that this data can be used for any purposes, for any apps, for any business or non-business, any profit or non-profit. And, and people were saying, like, I mean, that was a one, one, one big argument. They were saying, like, well, you know, like, this, da this data was collected by taxpayers' money. Why should someone make a business of it? And we say, why shouldn't they? I mean, like, also someone who makes, who's running a business is paying taxes, right? And, and anyone can do it. So if it's open to everyone, why not give it away? And at the end of the discussions, um, that wasn't the main point anymore, but it was a big, big, big argument within the negotiations. But for us, it was clear that the data should be used for any purposes, by anyone, for anything. Okay, okay yeah, I think we have another question from IRC. Yeah, uh, Sud from ISE uh, asks, who enforces the uh, laws? Uh, who enforces it if something does not get published? Mm -hmm. um, good question. I'm 
basically we have uh, uh, here in Hamburg we have a data protection officer who is also the freedom of information officer. So he's the first inter instance. So if you don't get an information, let's say within one month, or you think there should be something in the information register which you cannot find and which is not there, then you can turn to our freedom of information officer and he will be the first sort of the first instance to negotiate between you and the administration. If you're still not happy and you're not satisfied with what you get in terms of information, you can always go to court. And we do expect um, some cases to come up um, because, I mean, like, it's one thing to convince parliament and pass it, even pass it unanimously like we did here in Hamburg, but it's the next thing to actually convince 10,000 public servants to implement it and to actually keep to it, okay? And, um, and so there will be problems. Uh, we know that the administration is actually preparing a lot for this law, and you know, like they are seriously trying to implement it because we are on the council, but um, there will be problems, and there will be court cases as well. Hi, Gregor. Uh, my compliments. This is uh, the big social development achievement of the last years, I would uh, say. Uh, I am uh, in my free time uh, uh, doing comparable things uh, with my free city of Vienna in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. This is uh, 100 uh, times smaller than uh, Hamburg, but uh, the problem seems to be 100 uh, times bigger than here, so to see. Uh, one of the major questions uh, they, uh, they ask me when I come with uh, the comparable initiative is, who is going to pay for that? We don't have a budget for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your experience? Have you uh, had the same? Uh, was somebody asking you who is going to pay for that? Uh, because uh, this is a technical thing. You have uh, to put technicians on there. You have to supervise there. You have uh, to, uh, uh, to run the servers. Uh, you, you have to answer the questions. It's all money. Yes, uh, I mean, of course, you know, like uh, when the politicians ran out of arguments, I remember the last thing, you know, like they were asking, so who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I mean, that's always, you know, like if you don't, if you don't have any arguments uh, among the, uh, about this law, uh, so who's going to pay? You know, we have to save money, can't spend p taxpayers' money. And first thing is that, well, you know, like they, they will, they will, um, they were corruption damages in Hamburg, in the city of Hamburg, those that were actually discovered and they were prosecuted in the year 2010, and the damage was about 60 million euros just this one year uh, in terms of corruption by public servants. So if you think Germany is not a corrupt country, uh, think again. I mean, corruption is everywhere in every country, okay? Um, to a smaller extent and to a bigger extent. But here in Germany, I mean, like in Hamburg, we thought it was already quite big. So we said, like, well, if this freedom of, if this transparency law is preventing corruption, you know, you can save a lot of money of those damages, number one. Um, the second thing is, like, yes, there will be some cost, and they will, it will cost some money to actually come up with an information register and to invest in software. But it will also make things easier. For instance, uh, in the past, you know, like civil servants had, inf had problems getting information from each other. So you're working in this department, environmental department, you want information of the economic department, you know, it takes you a long time to get that information. If it's all in the central repository, it actually makes your life, your work life much easier. So it actually saves staff to have this information register. It's like introducing a wiki at your work, you know, like you can work on the same thing at the same time. So um, that's number one. Second thing is like you won't have all these individual requests anymore because if the city has to publish information by law, there's no need to, uh, re to actually answer individually. Um, but still, there's money, uh, there's still you need some money and um, we don't really have figures right now. We think this will probably cost something like five to ten million or something one off in the beginning to establish this information register and it will cost a lot of training efforts to train the public servants to change their workflow. That's um, upfront money. 
yes, first but, pain and then. But, then but you know. yes, it's it's a bit of upfront money. But it's funny, like once the politicians wanted to pass it, you know, to keep it away from the referendum, money suddenly wasn't a problem. They go say, oh, we'll just take it out of the global IT budget, you know, which is like 55 million a year in Hamburg, and we just prioritize it, you know, a bit but higher. So money is not a problem anymore. It's like it's it's only like in the in the political argument. So in your city, there will be a global budget for IT infrastructure. And then it's it's a question of setting priorities. And if this is a big priority in your city, then you'll mobilize the money for it. Thank you very much. Okay, another question from the internet. Yes, uh, Social Hack is asking, um, do you think the process of writing your own law could also work for the issue of net neutrality, which is much more complex? Um, I'm not too familiar with the net neutrality um, uh, topic, but I also wasn't very familiar with uh, freedom of information laws or transparency laws. And the thing is, the good thing is that there's nothing so complicated in a democracy that ordinary citizens, as we had it as a quote in the beginning here, are not capable of doing this. And if you don't know how to do things, you'll get and find someone who knows about it. I mean, like we did, we weren't lawyers, but at this stage where we needed a lawyer, we found a very, very good one. And um, and that's the cool thing, you know, like if you start a coalition and you just, you know, like you get people mobilized, you know, you'll solve every problem that comes and crosses your way. So don't think that anything can be too complicated, especially when you pass a law, you know, like you hope that politicians understand the law they are passing in parliament. And if you wanted to pass a law by referendum, it must be readable and explainable to every citizen who, are, who you're expecting to vote for it. So I don't think there's any matter or any issues um, that can be regulated by law or should be regulated by law that are too complicated for people to understand. If we resort to that thought, you know, like we are in an expert oligarchy and we leave democracy. And um, that's why I'm really encouraging everyone, even if you're not a lawyer, read our law. And it's, uh, it's really easy to understand because we all had to understand it, right? I mean, we, we, we wouldn't have campaigned for something that we didn't understand, like, with the last um, sentence in it. And um, it's um, on the website, transparenzgesetz.de, and in English, um, slash English. And we even have an English translation, so you can take it also to other countries and use it as a draft, just like we did in the beginning. The first thing is, like, when you start with net neutrality, the first thing you would do is like, is there any city, any state, any country in the world that has issued legislation? Are there any NGOs that have made proposals? Are there any ideas out there? So we would got ideas from the US, ideas from Australia, uh, Slovakia, Britain, etc. And we took the best, best practice from all, all over the world and assembled it into our own legislation. And we offer this law to anyone to copy and paste it, or to be inspired by it. And I think that's also possible for any other topic, including uh, net neutrality. Yeah, well, that, uh, that leads me uh, very directly to, to my question, as you pointed out once more, uh, how brilliantly uh, you, uh, you tackled the part of, of passing the law. And I'm, I'm more than a bit astonished that when, uh, when you say on one hand that you clearly expect the, uh, the administration uh, not to fully cooperate, uh, that uh, on the other hand it sounded a bit like you would limit yourself to just take them to court and, uh, and uh, have, uh, have them have them eat it, uh, rather than uh, than uh, taking some uh, some more subtle approaches uh, that uh, might uh, prove uh, to be uh, more efficient in the end. Um, well, I would say like we take every approach. I mean, like we don't we we we're, we're staying realistic. We think that there will be court cases, but we are not provoking them. So mm -hmm. we were, for instance, the ones that were requesting. Um, the contracts about the concert hall, and we were thinking, we were thinking, well, this is going to be controversial. We don't know whether they're going to publish it. We are prepared to take them to court, but of course, we won't issue a press release if, you, if they don't issue it. You know, we take it to court. I think that's 
a normal citizen's right to do that, but you should not go into public and you know threaten anyone. Of course, you know, like what we introduced in those laws also, that we are on the advisory board to implement the law, to be constructive and to be in constant talks and discussions. But of course, you know, like you, you also have to make 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 uh, sure to politicians because there are different interests. You know, like this is a information is power. You know, like it's our freedom of information officer always calls information the oil of the 21st century. And of course, you know, like there will be people working against you, and you know, like you have to be prepared for any for any battle that has to come without necessarily having to talk about it. So if I'm a bit more, um, you know, like if, if it sounded too aggressive in, 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 in your ears, um, it was meant to be so. So far there wasn't any court case, and we hope that they, has, they, they, they don't have to be a court case. But we're prepared. But at the same time, of course, we are constructively in the advisor, on the advisory board, and we're helping politicians to implement the law, and, and we will also, um, basically explain ourselves to anyone that's interested and wherever we can help, we help, of course. Okay, thank you very much, Gregor. Our time is up. And please give him some extra credit for dealing that relaxed with the strange world of Windows Update.